What does the birth of a newly born cow in Israel have to do with end time events and the rebuilding of the third temple in Jerusalem? And why would God allow the Jewish people to reinstitute a sacrificial system of putting innocent animals to death? We'll also explore how secret labs are engineering hybrids of humans and animals into grotesque monsters known as chimeras. And by the way, could the Antichrist in some form be a chimera, a hybrid human? Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. Talk about the possible fulfillment of a major end times biblical prophecy. Recently, a red heifer was born in Israel that's become yet another candidate to be raised and especially cared for by the Orthodox Jews in the hopes that the young cow will be able to fulfill conditions that will ultimately lead to the reinstitution of temple sacrifices. You see, in order to reinstitute animal sacrifices, the Bible specifies that the ashes of a red heifer are necessary for purification rites. The newborn heifer underwent an extensive examination by rabbinical experts, and they determined that the young cow is currently flawless, and therefore she's a viable candidate for the biblical red heifer that's described in Numbers chapter 19 in the Torah. The newborn heifer was certified by a board of rabbis, but the animal will have to be examined again in order to determine whether it continues to possess the necessary flawless characteristics to qualify as the biblical red heifer for sacrifice. You see, such a candidate is an absolute necessity. It's a prerequisite in order to start divine services in a third temple that's yet to be rebuilt. In an announcement, the Temple Institute in Jerusalem explained that the red heifer is essential to the rebuilding of the temple because the animal will be needed to be sacrificed in order to complete the ritual of purification for the new temple. Religious Jews also believe this step is part of the process that signals the coming of Messiah and the final judgment. Throughout Jewish history, there have been reportedly only nine true red heifers, all of which form the continuity over the generations for the ashes of purification. And now a tenth candidate will reportedly herald the construction of the new temple. Several red heifers have been born in the past decade or so, and they've created quite a stir. But they were all eventually disqualified for not meeting the strict biblical requirements. The red heifer must be born from a natural birth and be entirely red, with no more than two non-red hairs on his body. So the reddish-colored female calf is being raised in accordance with the Jewish law specified in the Torah. In Numbers chapter 19, the Lord spoke to Moses and his brother Aaron, the high priest, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and have them bring you a red heifer without defect. There could be no blemish in it. And never can a yoke come upon it, a yoke of servitude. The priest is to take some cedar wood, some hyssop, and scarlet wool. These are all symbolic pictures of salvation. And throw these onto the sacrifice heifer. And all of this is burned together. Then the ashes of the heifer are to be gathered up and put in a ceremonially clean place and kept by the Israelite community for use in the water of cleansing. It's for purification from sin. Jewish tradition also requires that the heifer be three to four years old when it's finally sacrificed for the purification and rebuilding of the temple. The writer of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament may mention of the red heifer in Hebrews chapter 9, explaining that the sacrifice is all about salvation and the ultimate blood sacrifice of the Messiah, Yeshua. 
Hebrews says the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. But how much more then will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, how much more will he cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Amen. Well, those of us who are assured that our sins have been covered and forgiven by the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus, Yeshua, we rejoice in our salvation that we receive by faith. But we also are watching carefully what's happening in Israel because all of this activity around the coming third temple does point ultimately to the redemption of Israel when Yeshua the Messiah returns as the triumphant lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, all of this animal imagery in the Bible is so important to understand prophetically. At his first coming, Jesus came from heaven as the Lamb of God to accomplish atonement for the world at the cross by voluntarily offering up his sinless blood for sinners. At that time, the Jewish people were expecting the Lion of the tribe of Judah to deliver them from the oppression of Roman rule. Jesus was indeed from King David's line, from the tribe of Judah. But his mission on his first coming was to be God's suffering servant, God's lamb as portrayed and prophesied in Isaiah 52 and 53. Now soon he will return in triumph like the roaring lion of Judah to put down Israel's enemies and to save the Israeli nation. All prophetic events are leading up to his soon return. Meanwhile, this is the third consecutive year of a record-breaking number of Jews coming up to the Temple Mount seeking God. Jews from all walks of life, religious and non-religious Jews, public figures, young people, old people, former paratroopers from the 1967 war, rabbis, students, they've all been visiting the Temple Mount despite persecution from the Muslim minders. And the Jewish people have been increasingly trying to reconnect with the place that they believe the God of Israel chose as his dwelling place on earth. Recently, the Temple Institute posted on Facebook that in the past year, 28,800 Jewish persons had ascended the Temple Mount, they claimed, in purity. But, as somebody commented on Facebook, how can the Jews claim to ascend in purity when the people of Israel are still considered ceremonially impure until the red heifer is sacrificed and the ashes of purification become a reality? Well, it's an interesting and provocative question. And these are all issues of great prophetic significance, to say the least. While the possibility of a red heifer initiating temple service keeps us on our toes prophetically, there is a much more sinister aspect prophetically to the world of animals concerning the controversial issue of transhumanism. You see, the goal of transhumanism is to fundamentally transform the human condition by developing technologies that purportedly will enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. But the issue boils down to this. Humans were created in God's image. Dare we change what God has created into a hybrid species? Already scientists have announced that they have created the first successful human-animal hybrids. Scientists have proven that human cells can be introduced into non-human organisms, namely pigs, and human cells can grow inside a host animal. A website that networks organ procurement for organ transplants reported that every 10 minutes a person is added to the national waiting list in the United States for organ transplants, and every day, 22 persons on that list die without obtaining the organs that they needed. 
What if, rather than relying on the generosity of donors, they could grow a custom organ inside an animal? Could such research and experiments ever be considered ethical? I can only think of Mary Shelley's sinister novel, Frankenstein, the story of a young scientist who created a grotesque monster in an unorthodox scientific experiment. So far, public opinion has resisted the creation of part human, part animal organisms. But many scientists enthuse that human-animal hybrids will benefit mankind with lab-grown organs. To me, it's definitely not kosher, but pig organs have a notable similarity to humans. Although they take less time to gestate, pig organs apparently look a lot like ours. The larger goal of such a practice could be, for example, growing a human kidney in a pig for transplant back into a human. It seems society is on a slippery slope towards acceptance because already most people now generally accept the practice of genetically modified food. But are genetically modified organisms acceptable? Are we willing to accept an animal-human chimera? One scientist asks where to draw the human boundary. Placing human stem cells into animal embryos raises profound questions about the nature of humanity. At the end of the day, if truth be told, only Holy Scripture can give lasting answers. And the truth is, human beings are created, it says here in the book of Genesis, in God's image. There is indeed an inherent distinction between humans and other created things. How can we therefore merge and muddle them without causing immense trouble? Will technology, often in the hands of atheists or agnostics, seek to preserve the worth, the dignity, and the value of human beings? We're distinctly different from other life, but tragically, I don't think so. Theologians express legitimate concerns because of the reality of human depravity and deceit. It's difficult to be optimistic about the future use of many technologies. We simply don't know the long-term effects and consequences of human stem cells placed in animals. The ethical argument claims that human life itself is of far more value than merely the quality of human life. Our ultimate goal should not be just the quality of life, in other words, the quality of life must never overshadow the value and meaning of life itself as defined in the Bible. I found the following quote very reassuring. Can does not mandate ought. Just because technologically you can do something doesn't mean you ought to do it. Perhaps with some of these procedures, such as placing human stem cells in animal embryos, it would be wise not to do them at all. Because as a civilization, are we that arrogant or confident in our own wise judgment to be certain that these technologies will never be used for evil ends? History doesn't give me much confidence in the ability of the human race to make such wise and righteous decisions. Take, for example, in recent history, Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany's racially based social policies placed the biological improvement of the Aryan race or the so-called Germanic master race through eugenics at the center of Nazi ideology. In Germany, eugenics were mostly known under the synonymous term racial hygiene. According to Wikipedia following the Second World War, both terms effectively vanished and were replaced by human genetics. And here's a question that should be asked. Why is the Antichrist, who is called the beast in the book of Revelation, why is he called a beast? I believe no word is in the Bible by accident. Bearing in mind that in mythology, chimeras were hybrids, there's the possibility that the beast of the end times, the Antichrist, will be a chimera of sorts. Could history repeat itself? 
After all, chimeras, hybrids happened previously in the days of Noah, according to the Bible. Men and women became hybrids called the Nephilim, meaning the fallen ones. That's certainly food for thought. And because of it, God destroyed all human flesh except for one family in the days of Noah, as recorded in the book of Genesis, because angels had corrupted the genetics of mankind by interbreeding with them. The argument goes that Noah and his family were saved not only because of their faith and because Noah was a preacher of righteousness, but also because Noah and his family were not genetically contaminated. So as we look into Genesis 6-9, Noah is described as both righteous in his generation and perfect. The word perfect in this context means complete, whole, sound, it doesn't mean that he was perfectly holy or without any character faults. But many Bible scholars believe perfect can mean that Noah and his family were totally human and they weren't part of the so-called Nephilim, the fallen ones. And thus Noah and his family qualified to repopulate the earth. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that the beast, the so-called Antichrist of the Bible, might be genetically engineered in some way, but certainly he will be indwelt by a satanic being, thus accounting for his powers and truly making him beast-like. Over in the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation 11, 7, we're told that the beast ascends from the abyss, a place where fallen angels are incarcerated. And so he'll be indwelt by a demon that's been contained within the abyss. Now, the Bible severely warns people against submitting to what's called the mark of the beast, which will be some sort of mark, tattoo, microchip, or DNA alteration located in a person's forehead or hand. And the Bible warning is so severe it says that eternal damnation will be the consequence of taking the mark of the beast. The Bible stresses that anyone who receives the mark of the beast cannot be saved. Now, could it be because the mark of the beast might involve a procedure that could alter one's genetics? This deception the so-called mark of the beast, could be presented to society as a great evolutionary leap forward for mankind. But there could be devastating consequences. Please consider very carefully what I'm going to say, because Adam, the first man, was created in the image of God. In theology, Jesus is called the second Adam because he was sent from heaven as the Savior to redeem Adam's descendants who fell from grace due to sin. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 47, the first man was from the dust of the earth, but the second man came from heaven. Now, this is what I want to emphasize. Jesus did not suffer and die to save a hybrid race. He suffered and died to save human beings who were created in the image of God. Yet in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, the Antichrist is repeatedly called the beast. I counted them at least 16 times in that chapter. So I went to the dictionary and I refreshed my memory on the definition of a beast. It's any non-human animal, especially a large four-footed mammal. But the word beast also refers to the crude animal nature common to humans and the lower animals, describing a cruel, coarse, or otherwise beast-like person. The mark of the beast, as described in Revelation 13, 17, says that it's necessary so that no one could buy or sell anything unless they have that mark which will be the name of the beast or the number of its name. So think for a moment about the implications of taking the mark of the beast. By association, if you take a mark of a beast, that means it would make anybody beast-like 
are chimera-like, would it not? So my friends, such technology is a slippery slope that could alter the human race as we know it. Again, Jesus didn't die for hybrids. He died for human beings in God's image. This is all pretty scary stuff, calling for much wisdom and discernment. Well, now, getting back down to earth in today's program, the discussion of the red heifer and the possibility that Third Temple will be rebuilt soon brings up questions that are frequently asked by believers who want to know why God would allow animal sacrifices to be reinstituted again, especially since Jesus the Messiah, the Lamb of God, has already completed the final sacrifice once and for all for sins. People write to me about this all the time. They say, isn't the matter closed? The whole idea and push for the reinstitution of animal sacrifices disturbs many Christians because they strongly feel that the sacrifice of Jesus is enough and that it would be denied and ignored by returning again to animal sacrifices. All I know is that Bible prophecy reveals that the temple sacrifices in Jerusalem will be reinstituted whether Christians agree with it or like it or not. The bottom line is we mustn't always argue and question God's ways and what the Bible clearly reveals but rather we must believe that God knows what he's doing. You see, many theologians explain that the temple sacrifices that will take place during the millennium will be memorials of the atonement that was procured by Jesus when he cried from the cross, it is finished. The animal sacrifices will be memorials that will remind us of the awfulness of sin and how grateful we are that Jesus paid the price for our salvation. For the Bible teaches that it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Quoting the book of Leviticus, Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So future temple sacrifices will be a reminder of the seriousness of sin. Animal sacrifices were initiated by God after Adam and Eve fell in sin. And in Genesis 3.21, God clothed Adam and Eve with animal skins, meaning an animal had to be killed and blood was shed to cover their nakedness and their sin. This is a lesson and a picture of their sin being washed, their sin being atoned for by blood and covered. Likewise, at the end of the book in Revelation 3.18, Jesus counseled the church to buy white garments from him because it's only his blood that cleanses us from sin. This principle is seen in Isaiah 1.18, where Isaiah prophesied, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red as crimson, they'll be like wool. That verse spoke of the work of the Lamb of God. The Jewish people expected the Messiah to be connected to the divinic line. They expected Messiah to be a member of the tribe of Judah because of the prophecy in Genesis 49 that from Judah the Messiah would come. The Jewish people expected the Messiah to be a fierce leader, lion-like. They were caught off guard by the Lamb of God. But Jesus is all of that. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah who has overcome and he's worthy in heaven as the lamb to open God's scroll with its seven seals. Jesus, Yeshua, has earned the right to take back the earth from Satan's temporary domain. Jesus has proven himself to be king of kings and lord of lords through his atoning death by his resurrection and his ascension to the Father in heaven. At the cross and the grave, Jesus conquered Satan, death, and sin. Now he is the conquering lion of Judah. And providentially, his picture is already as the lion on the flag of Jerusalem. It's so fascinating in the book of Revelation that St. John the Revelator looked into his visions at the Lion of Judah, and behold, the lion became a lamb. What a revelation. 
because the lion is the lamb and the lamb is the lion. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is also the lion of Judah who will destroy Satan and set up his kingdom for a thousand years on earth. In John's heavenly vision, the lamb is alive, but he appears to have been slain. It's all glorious imagery, and someday soon the Jewish people will totally comprehend this imagery of the Lamb of God because it's in their spiritual DNA, the animal sacrifices. They understand that animal sacrifice is necessary, going all the way back to the beginning of the book of Genesis. And God is setting it all up for Israel's redemption. So I just can't comprehend how people can believe that there's no future for Israel when it's so clear in this book, the Bible. There's going to come a time of restoration and salvation for them. We long to see that happen, to vindicate this word of God and to prove that God is a promise keeper. No matter how wayward, no matter how far Israel wandered from God, no matter how secular they became or how hostile to the gospel, the day is coming soon when God will bring Israel to himself. Lord, we thank you for the veracity of your promise that all of Israel shall be saved. Amen. Well, also in the news again this week in so many ways and monuments, Satanists are working overtime to stop the work of evangelicals by trying to infiltrate churches and stop free speech, stop preaching, and close down Christian organizations to sabotage us. But are we surprised? No, we're not surprised because in Matthew 24, 12, Jesus warned and clearly prophesied that in the last days there will be a multiplication of wickedness. But the good news is the Savior still saves to the uttermost, and there's also great power in prayer. Well, I pray that through this program today, the Lord will convict some gospel needing persons to receive the Savior, to receive the Lord by faith, confessing Jesus as Lord, as Savior, healer, and deliverer. And in the meantime, let's purpose to be strong, as Daniel 11:32 says. Let's know our God and continue to accomplish exploits, to do the works of the Lord, knowing that Time is very short before the second coming. And fellowship in these last days is so vitally important. So let's encourage one another on the social media. And I invite you to visit our website at exploits.tv where you can watch any of our videos 24-7. And you can sign up for our free color magazine, Exploits. I'm also reminding you right now to download our free Jerusalem Channel app. And so until next time, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem, I'm Christine Dark. Shalom and Maranatha. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching.